one of my most favorite people in the entire world is sharing the word today. Um, I can't believe he's been on our staff for, for almost a year, a year in April, which is crazy because it's only been less than a year, but also so much has happened since he's been here. Um, uh, Pastor Brad is, uh, he's an author. He just finished his third book. He's a fourth book, fourth book. He's a business coach. He loves people. He loves, um, he loves you guys. And uh, so, and I'm not going to, I'll let you spoil. Okay, he became a grandfather last week. Yeah, Maria. So uh, can you guys jump up to your feet and celebrate Pastor Brad as he comes to bring the word today. Hallelujah. Welcome. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we had one of those unusual moments in the first service, although as a, as a preacher, I have a lot of un unusual moments, although sometimes I think it's part of God's plan for my life. I have unusual moments. And I thought I would, like, be humorous. And maybe that was the first mistake, right? <laughs> but I just shared with people that as pastors, we do experience a wide range of things. So we get people who send us emails and say, your message was outstanding. You are truly a gift to us. You're an angel. <laughs> Thank you. But on the same day, regarding the same sermon, you can get an email that says, you are a heretic. You're a devil. I hate you. That's a couple of emails pushed together. They don't always come just like that. No, I'm kidding. But we can have highs. We can have lows. We can say something, and some people love it, and some people hate it. Believe it or not, I'm going to do my best to give you a great message this morning. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. So I'm telling all this in the first service, and I go, I have found the antidote to all of this. And somebody shouts out, Jesus! But that wasn't what I was going to say. I was going to say, have a grandchild. <laughs> Suddenly I'm faced with Jesus, which is the answer. Anyway, I just realized in the course of the week this incredible impact that this arrival has. Her name is Karis Grace Thompson, and Karis in Greek means grace, and so my granddaughter is called Grace Upon Grace. So it really is exciting. And uh, like any seasoned grandfather, <laughs> I can somehow weave my granddaughter into my sermon. But the reality is that the reason, it's not the reason, but one of the reasons why my son and his, and his wife called her Grace, Karis, Grace upon Grace, is because we do have another grandchild, but she went to be with Jesus in the first trimester. And my son and, and daughter had a, had a miscarriage. Her name was Paige. And just this tremendous sadness, tremendous pain. Um, I've always thought, um, you know, death, death impacts me. I've lost friends. I've lost my dad. I've lost my father-in-law. And I mourn and I move on. And we've kind of been um, okay-ish with it. I could never describe the pain that I felt as we lost our grandbaby and as I watched my son and, and his stunning wife just, just torn apart by this thing. Uh, they came across to the United States and, and they're just finishing up an internship in Texas and they went to go and see doctors and the doctor said to them, unfortunately there's a problem, you guys will never have kids. It's not going to happen. And unfortunately, uh, God is not on that mailing list. <laughs> because where the doctor said impossible, God saw Karis. And that's part of the message this morning, is that when the world is showing you something or when you're feeling something, let's take some time to consider what God is actually saying. Let's take some time to see what God is seeing and let's believe that. 
because he is the God that's able to change all of these things from bad to good, from difficulty to, to joy. And I'd, just for those folk that have been through heartbreak and, and have, have had to go through miscarriages, for those folk whose children have passed before you, which I've always felt is a, a really unfair cut somehow, that it's meant for the parents to go first, I just want to tell you, I'm excited by my story, but I'm very, very aware how sore this, just this little intro could be for you. So I just want to stand with you this morning and just say we, we share your pain, we share your disappointment. Can I continue to point you to Jesus, that within this place you will find his transformative presence, his transforming miraculous power that will lift you up from a place of pain and devastation to, to something joyful. Amen? Amen. All righty. So the, the title of today, so, so we're going through Revelation. We've had, we've had some outstanding stuff from Darren. We then had Pastor Greg just get on up, and I noticed that he came in with a smart jacket when he preached. And then last week, Pastor Masood comes up. Just an outstanding sermon. The content fantastic. The passion, unbelievable. But he just looks like a billionaire. And I thought, okay, I'd better get my jacket out. I try and avoid jackets and I, I try and avoid anything too formal, but just to try and keep, so that if the, rub, if, if the sermon is really rubbish, at least I try to look like Pastor Masood. <laughs> So, that if you're trying to take notes, the, the title of today's sermon is Pole Axing the Pergamum Paradigm. Plenty powerful words for a pretty powerful preach. For the Baptists, they understand that that's alliteration. Everybody else is when you start words with the same letter. Well, that went down well. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of Baptists in this morning. Poleaxing is a word that probably we hear more in English and we use it in South Africa, but poleaxing is destroying. It is decimating. It is totally annihilating something. When someone gets poleaxed, they're probably going to die. If someone's driving somewhere and they get poleaxed, it's a massive accident. It's destruction. I'm wanting to destroy some paradigms this morning. And a paradigm is some habitual thought. It's possibly a belief system. Are we going to make it through? I can feel my voice getting excited already. It's a belief system. It is a methodology. It is a process that immediately biases a potential outcome. We okay with that? It's, if you like, a lens. The next person to preach, this is the new standard. So as I look out at you, I can see you all, I can see the building, I can see that I've got two hours left, I can see what's happening out there. When I put the lenses on, I can still see you. I can still see most of the building, it's different. It's different. Now, I gave these a little bit of a wipe this morning because I, dr I, I drove in wearing them. So they are clean. But if they were dirty, then there's a very good chance I could put my paradigm, I could put it on, and the dirt would not allow me to see what I'm looking at clearly. In fact, I'd like to suggest that if this was blocked off, the, the actual truth could be in front of me, and because of my paradigm, I could miss it. I could misinterpret it, or I could, I could look at it, and any of the truth that, gosh, any of the truth that came from that would be distorted because my paradigm is faulty or my paradigm is distorted. And I believe that there are minimum three paradigms, there might be four, but there are minimum three paradigms with regards to the book of Revelations and in particular the letters to all the churches. I'm speaking on the church at Pergamum today, uh, which is Revelations chapter 2, 12 to 17, but if, if our paradigm is wrong, 
then we could get a wrong picture from this book. So the first paradigm, <laughs> coffee. I'm just um, coming off a couple of weeks of pneumonia, and so just getting oxygen in, but then you know, getting a noise out of my throat. My wife has loved the time, actually. It's been the quietest the house has ever been. <laughs> the first paradigm that I'd like to poleaxe is that the book of Revelations is about a God of vengeance, retribution, and judgment. That he is a bad-tempered, grumpy old man that is looking to go out of his way to cause you and I as much pain as possible. It is true that God judges. But that's not the only thing he does. He's a God of so many different dimensions, so many different aspects, but if our if our lens is going to be a judgmental God, then that's all I'm going to see. And in this passage today, there's language there that sounds just like this. But I don't believe it's the heart of the book of Revelations. I understand that the book of Revelations is also about things to come. So that's the second paradigm. That the book of Revelations is about end times only. It is about end times. But it's not only about end times. One of the concepts that I continue, continuously wrestle with is the truth that God is outside of time. He's not bound by time. His truth, therefore, cannot be bound by time. And so even when there is a prophetic book, there is an element of future to it but we're reading about Pergamum, which happened two, 1,900 years ago, and there's Seattle, Eden, oh, 24th of March. I might actually whip this thing off at some point. Uh, where was I? It's still valid for Eden, Seattle, 2024. And if our paradigm is that Revelations is only about a time to come, then there, what is the application to us? There's no pressure on me to take what I read and look at my life and go, do I match up to this word? Because it is the truth of God. So my, my, my plumb line and my measurement is the word of God. But if this is only gonna happen in the future, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't read Revelations, because I'm not sure that it applies to them right now. What a waste of time. Folks, Revelation is as valid right now to right this minute as it was to the church in Pergamum as it is when the rest of Revelation begins to be revealed. But let's just shatter that, that paradigm. I wanna step back a second because I wrote down an example just before I came up and, and that's with regards to the first paradigm. I was, um, I think I was just falling asleep last night and I was channel surfing, which I, I do. <laughs> and I saw a, a shot that reminded me of Africa on YouTube, and so I clicked on it, and it was a huge, great big lion, magnificent, huge big mane. And he was easing down the road like he owned it, as the lions do. Anybody who gets to go to Africa and, and go into the wild, you can tell that lions are coming before you've heard them or see them. And that's because all the other animals know they own this spot, let's go. And this father was walking along, and there were a couple of cubs running with him, so it was a really beautiful scene, and I'm like, hey. I mean, we didn't see that in our front garden. We had to go to a game farm for it, but you do get a lot of that in Africa. And one of the cubs, um, I don't know what he did. I don't speak lion, but he ran somewhere he shouldn't have gone. He did something he shouldn't have done, and it upset Papa Lion. And Papa Lion spun around and belted him with his hand, broke his back and killed him. Now, in nature, that happens. We understand, and even the cub probably had an understanding that this papa lion could kill it. I'm not sure whether there was any intent on behalf of the big daddy lion to kill his son, but this power, this incredible strength in this massive animal was just unleashed and this cub was killed instantly. Well, 
very soon. Too often, people view God like that. I mustn't upset God because I'm going to get my back broke. The reality is God can judge. The reality is that God could snuff us all out in a second. The reality is all powerful. But unlike the lion, he's very aware of his strength. And that is why he can be gentle. It's only when you're strong that you can be gentle. When you've got the power to break something and you choose not to, that's gentleness. When you don't have the power to hurt something, you're just weak. I'm not negative weak, you're just not strong enough. But God has all the power to take us out. And so I just want to rip that out of our thinking. God withholds his awesome power. Otherwise, this puppy right here would not be alive. Would have died a long time ago. <laughs> See, not everyone likes the sermon. It just is the way that it is. The f- in line with this is the paradigm that the, the letters to the seven churches in Relations 1, 2, 3 is where we have a God that comes and pats and loves with one hand and then strikes down with the other. So I love that you've done this and you've done this, but this I hold against you and I'm going to judge you. Now the reality is there's some of that, but that's not all seven churches. Two of the churches are encouraged. Two of the churches, God goes, I love what you're doing, keep going. The church in Smyrna, we heard last week, under incredible persecution, and yet they stood strong, and they are commended. So all of a sudden, this picture of this God that cuddles us with one hand and belts us with the other is just exploded. The church at Philadelphia, which interestingly enough means brotherly love, uh, is under massive, okay, all seven churches in these letters are under massive persecution. In that time, Christianity was persecuted. It was a huge threat to everybody. I loved listening. I don't love listening to persecution, but I love the revelation. Here, my conversion doesn't really cost me much. But in Pergamum and in the Middle East and the Far East to this day, you become Christian, you literally can be killed. And that's persecution. And the church at Philadelphia stood up for this Furthermore, they were very impoverished, the church at Philadelphia, but they continued to be great givers, if you go and read Philippians. Great givers. The other thing that they did is they were great evangelists. They spread the gospel no matter how much persecution was upon them. And so God gives credit to the churches that stand against persecution and the churches that evangelize. The point being that God is not a double-minded, confused God that feels he's got to do some earthly management program on you that loves you with one hand and belts you with the other. Are we okay? Maybe I need to ask myself if I'm okay. Let's have a look at Revelations 2 and the story to the church at Pergamum. And I think there might be some words that come up, and it's probably going to be the New Living Translation. I think that (laughs) Revelation... um, has got some interesting pictures and some interesting language in it without us looking at the King James Version as well. So let's go with the NLT. I don't know, all the people online who love the King James Version, God bless you as well. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with a sharp two-edged sword. You can see already by this language, thinking of a God that is not vengeful and violent is difficult. But we'll get to that. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Very specific, very, very interesting language. Yet, you have remained loyal to me. Brilliant. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you in Satan's city. Two very, very interesting Uh, descriptive words there. Verse 14, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed King Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sins. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin. <laughs> so another tough verse this. Repent of your sin or I will come suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
loving language. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name on it that no one understands except the one who receives it. Unfortunately, I've just realized that I didn't go very much into that last verse. I will do, watch the space, I'll get it through to you. Verse 17 says, anyone with an ear, let him hear. Hebrew language and the Hebrew people love stories. They love ideas. They love concepts. And so he who has an ear, let him hear, is their way of saying, you've got a brain, please use it. And the point that I want to make with this, as we'll see with the Nicolaitans, is that irrespective of how I preached this morning or how Pastor Masood preached last week, please go and research. Please go and read the same passages. Please go and get into some concordances so that you get a revelation for yourself. When you get to heaven, Brad Thompson cannot be your ticket in. You, are, you stand alone. And so don't walk away from this morning and go, well, that was brilliant, or that was rubbish. That, at the end of the day, is less important than have you got into this and found a meaning that is applicable to you right now that is going to impact your walk with Jesus. Because ultimately, that's who you're going to stand in front of Jesus with, is yourself. So trying to understand a paradigm in Scripture, yep, so just go and research. <laughs> don't just take what I say as fact. As much as I feel that I'm like totally enlightened, I do have a paradigm. And so even I can study th things and see stuff in that Brad wants to see or that are impacted by Brad's par paradigms. So as we have a look at these paradigms, I felt that it was very important to think about who was writing the letter. Who did Jesus specifically handpick to write Revelation? He could have chose anybody. He chose John. Why? So we're going to have a look at that. I then feel we need to have a look at the city of Pergamum. Who was the letter to? And then, what is the application to us going forward? Amen. Woo! <laughs> All right. The book is written by John, the Apostle John. Um, it, it, from all the study that I've done, it appears that the Apostle John is the youngest of all the apostles. He was probably, and the, the different readings of John, between 14 and 17, give or take a year, when Jesus starts his public ministry. He's a young guy. In uh, John chapter, let's get my numbers right here. In John chapter 13 and verse 23, <laughs> this is the gospel of John. In other words, it's written by John, so I love this. There was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So John writes of himself, this is the apostle that Jesus loved. It's the same way as Moses wrote, Moses was the humblest guy in town. <laughs> and we, our first lens is that, my goodness, that is incredibly arrogant. But actually, it's incredibly important. One of my mentors in life, and he, he's an indirect mentor because I only ever met him for seven and a half or eight minutes, but I studied, uh, worked in his business for a long time, but his name is Lou Tice. And he would often quote the Bible in his lectures without saying it's the Bible. He would say something like, it says somewhere that love your neighbor as you love yourself. I find that people do, and that's the problem. And the reference that he was making is, there is so much chaos on the planet right now. There is so much violence. There are Christians eating Christians. There are people fighting with people. And Lou is saying, this is an indication of how much we love ourselves. And so for an apostle, or for anybody, to get a revelation of how much they are actually loved by God is critical. Because otherwise, I can read Song of Songs, if you want but I can see an angry, distant God if I don't understand God's love for me. And I'm gonna tell you straight up, if, if we're gonna go for a bit of honesty and a little bit of honesty, it's been my biggest struggle in Christianity. I can understand the theology and the doctrine, but having a true belief that God would love me is, a, is my biggest hurdle. But I wonder what we could do to this planet if we really got a hold of that. 
Who would be, what, what would be the things I would take on if I really had an understanding that God loved me? And it wasn't just a head knowledge, it was a heart knowledge. And it's to this person that Jesus chooses to reveal or, or write the letter Revelations to, to Pergamum and to the other churches. I'm going to suggest that John was Jesus' cousin. Now, uh, this is borne out by a couple of things in the book of Mark chapter 16 and verse 1. Um, Jesus has passed away and the ladies are preparing his body for burial. And so there's going to be um, ointments, there's going to be spices, there's going to be linen that the body gets wrapped up in. It, it was what the Jewish culture did at the time. But the reality is that if somebody died, it wasn't just any ladies who were free that morning that went and did that. It would be family. It would be close people, you're seeing someone close to yourself, you're dealing with a dead body, uh, it's going to be the family that do that. And Mark 16 verse 1 says, Mary Magdalene was there, and, and Mary, after her conversion, really was close with the apostles, with, with Mary, the mother of God, and part of that family, very close lady. It says Mary was there, and then it says, Salome, the mother of James and John, was there. Salome, the sister of Mary. And I believe that that makes John Jesus' cousin. Yep. Um, why is this important? I mean, I, I don't know if Pastor Josh has come back. I think they might still be busy with a debrief, but I love Pastor Josh. I'm so glad that we are in each other's lives. We're becoming great friends. We work very, very well together. Uh, I love his perspective on some of the decisions that we've got to make. We have similar sense of humor. We get along really well. And I haven't even touched on worship yet. This is a great guy. But I'm not yet ready to have him lie with his head on my chest. <laughs> Nor am I that comfortable to go and place my head on his chest. As much as I love him, and yet I had the privilege on Christmas Day of being invited to Jeff and Chrissy. Uh, Jeff is um, uh, Josh's father-in-law. And they allowed us to be part of their family for Christmas Day. And so to have Josh and Jess there with the kids and all the other family members there, there is a, there's an affection between Jeff and Josh that's beautiful to watch. They didn't lie with their heads on each other, but it, there's <laughs> definitely an affection. There was definitely a, a connection because they were family. I don't get that with, with Josh yet. Maybe we'll work on it, report back at some point. And so I think that John lying against Jesus' chest is a sign of familiarity. It's a sign of, of family. Now, this is important from, oh, there's one other thing, and that is that um, there was a time when Salome went to Jesus and said, please, can my sons, John and James, sit on either side of you? And we look at it, well, I look at it anyway, and I go, this is only like the Messiah. This is only like the Messiah, sister, and you're going up asking for personal favors. In the Jewish culture, absolutely not. In the Jewish culture, the honor says we keep this in the family. Her, her request would have been perfectly normal. Can my kids sit on either side of you? Because we see you as the Messiah, we're with you. It appears that Salome actually funded a lot of Jesus' ministry, if you, if you go into certain texts. She was a believer, she was in, she wanted a place for her kids. This was not an embarrassing moment. It was not a difficult thing, if you were family, to ask. So I'm going with the fact that John was, was Jesus' cousin. Why is this important? Well, cousins grow up together. They see people at their best. They see people at their worst. And I know, once again, another paradigm is going to get rocked here because we, we, we find it difficult to talk about Jesus at his worst. You know, when you sing carols like, No crying he makes. I'm going, where is that in the Bible? But we, we have a picture that Jesus never had difficult times. The reality is, folks, he was 100% man. He was 100% God and he was 100% man. So I'm fairly sure that as, and he was a 13-year-old that was quite happy to let his parents walk away for several days because he was about his father's business and mom's stressed out of her skull and he's going, woman, do you not know that I'm about my father's business? As a 13-year-old, I can tell you what would have happened in my house. So it means that Jesus, was a, he was a teenager, he was a boy. So I'm sure that he and John and the mates and the rest of the cousins played Israeli football. 
I'm fairly sure that they went camping. I'm fairly sure that they were in each other's houses, eating, fighting, arguing, growing up together. You see family at their best and you see them at their worst. And this is important in the story of John and I'll get to it a little bit later. Let's just assume for a second that the sermon goes okay this morning. And I have a queue of people hugging me afterwards and offering me large volumes of cash. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. (laughs) Everybody's happy, I will guarantee you, and there's no names mentioned. But the other party in my marriage When we drive home, we'll go, dude, that joke really fell flat. You really might not want to do that again. Love you, Brad, but that metaphor that you used, I still am not 100% sure what you're talking about. And I love Maria, and I've kicked the doors down for Maria. I look forward to, I sometimes look forward to our, (laughs) our crits after a sermon, but it's family. Family has the right to look in and say, dude, you weren't as slick as you thought you were. Dude, try not to do that again. You lost a lot of people. Dude, an hour and a half. (laughs) I could have said what you said in seven minutes. (laughs) That's only happened like 12 times. So the point is that when John writes his gospel, having seen all of this, the other three gospels are very, very much Jewish in their nature. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they love to tell stories. They love to paint pictures in order to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Matthew lists an entire genealogy to let you know this is why you should believe in this. John, not at all. John writes as if Jesus is the Messiah. It's totally obvious and everyone gets it. And yet that's from a guy who grew up with him and saw him at his best and his worst. It makes this very, very impactful to me. John was, uh, he was, he was trained in Greek. The word logos comes from Greek, logos, logic. The Greeks loved to have facts. They loved logic. The Hebrews loved feelings, and they loved pictures, and they loved concepts. There's a, a, in some of the, the writings around logos, the picture or the language is to think with both hands. In other words, let's get all the information for, let's get all the information against, let's study it and come up with our stance. Very much John's methodology. But for him, he doesn't try and prove that Jesus is God. He just states it. In the beginning was the word. The word Jesus was with God. He doesn't try and explain it. That is, boom, that's the way it is. And it's to this person that Jesus gives the letter to Pergamum. He's known as the apostle of love. Very, very good. He uses the word love 39 times in his gospel. He uses the word love 34 times in his three letters, John 1, 2, 3, and he uses the word love eight times in the book of Revelation. That's 81 times that John speaks about love. He uses the term ego imi, E-G-O, and then the next word E-I-M-I, which is I am. It's It's what God spoke to Abraham, I am who I am. John uses it more than double the number of times the other three gospel writers added together. So for John, there is no discussion. This is the great I am. This is the Messiah, even though I've seen him through all of life's up and downs. And I love this guy. But it wasn't always that way. Jesus Within the group of the 12, he had three that were very close to him, Peter, James, and John. In fact, they were so close that he gave them nicknames. So Peter, Simon, Rock, John and James, sons of thunder. If we have a look in Mark 3, verse 17, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Jesus nicknamed them Boanerges. B-O-A-N-E-R-G-E-S, which means son of thunder, sons of thunder. Boanerges in Aramaic means sons of rage. These are the guys that went to Jesus and said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and decimate this village because they're giving us a hard time? Doesn't sound like a son of love or an apostle of love. 
And Jesus nicknamed them that. These were wild boys. I think they were ready to take it on anybody. And yet, there comes a point where he's known as the apostle of love. And this, this is part of the lens that I want to start us to begin to apply to the book of Revelation. Because what he is saying is whatever position you find yourself in, we are listening, we are reading to a God who is prepared to walk with you and restore you from a place of being a son of rage to being a loved apostle. This is a God who is happy to take you from a, pr- a place of depravity and get you saved and into his family. This is a God who will take you from sickness into health, from have not to overflowing, from sadness to rejoicing. Amen. This is hardly a God who is out to get you. If anything, it's a God who is looking for opportunities to build you and uplift you. I've jumped five notes. Let me find out where I'm here. All right. The Apostle of Love writing to the church at Pergamon. So let's start off uh, in the beginning. We, there's some language that is just very, very interesting here, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump around a little bit as we, as we go through it. The first thing that comes up in verse 12, uh, in verse 12, write this letter to the angel of the church at Pergamon. This, absolutely not. Let's go somewhere else. I want to go, I want to end there. Let's have a look at verse 13. We see some interesting language come up here. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Now, this is very, very specific language. There's a place further on where it talks about Satan's city. Now, would you agree with me that there are other religious expressions of other religions here in Seattle? And yet, we might not call it Satan's city. It's a city that's got other ideas. This language is fascinating. And I think that there is... A, a, probably a couple of meanings here. You see, there was a place, a physical place called Satan's throne. And it existed in a place called Babylon. It was a temple. And it was a, a center where Nimrod practiced Satan worship, burning babies and doing all kinds of weirdness in there. It had a number of thrones in it, and then it was surrounded with demonic um, carvings all around. This was an actual place, and I feel that John is poking fun at Satan here because he's going, my God is everywhere. But Satan is so small, he needs a throne in a place. I think he's telling Satan, you're not as big cheese as you think you are. And I think he's saying that to the writers as well, that you actually need a place. My God is everywhere. Now, what you will find very, very interesting is that there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the rise of Babylon, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about the restoration of Babylon, and um, some people think that it's really a Babylon system, it's a system of thinking, it's a religion possibly, but there are other people who believe that it's a place. There actually is a place, and there's a lot of people who believe that that place is Berlin in Germany. Now, if you have a look at the Second World War, some of the most outrageous things that we are looking at right now in terms specifically of sexual expression were already happening in Berlin. Some of the, the, the cross-dressing, the trance, although medically there might not have been much that they were doing then, but the experimentation, the sex, the drugs, and the rock and roll that went on in Berlin is being compared to Babylon. There was a time in Berlin where there were multiple rock bands per city block in Berlin because of the party scene and the availability of these kinds of things. There's a placeholder in that little snippet of information. Let's go back. We have a place in Babylon that is called Satan's throne. It gets destroyed. It then gets rebuilt in Pergamum. And so an actual place, an actual center that it is designed and shaped the same as the the throne of Satan in Babylon is now redesigned and built in Pergamum. 
So we don't just have a city that's got different religious beliefs. We have actual full-blown satanic worship going on in Pergamum. Now that gets destroyed over the years. You'll be happy to know that it was rebuilt in Berlin. You can go and see it to this day. The throne of Satan, the temple of Pergamum, with all its thrones and everything that are, that are put there. Adolf Hitler used that design to design some of the barracks for his SS troops. I mean, I just, it, it is important. It is important. As we spoke about earlier on about persecution, you're not, just, you're not just sitting with somebody who's going, look, man, I believe like all roads lead to Rome and whatever it is. You're actually sitting with someone who says, you give your life to Jesus, I'm going to kill you right now. You're looking at people who are going to sacrifice you at Satan's throne if you give your life to Jesus. And this is the letter to the, to the church of Pergamum. I love that you've stood strong, even though Antipas was martyred. Hallelujah. Verse 14, he says, they are the, but I have this against you. So you've stood strong, and we've got to be careful of standing in judgment against these guys. I mean, I'm not, I've never been persecuted at that level. I don't know what my response would be. I'd love to tell you that somebody puts a gun against my head, I would, I would not denounce Jesus, but no one's ever done that. I have had a gun against my head, and I can tell you, no thought went through my brain. <laughs> That's the biggest fright I ever had in my life. I don't know what scared me more, the, the gun or the eyes of the man holding it, because I could see he was totally unhinged. The gun could have gone off at any second. Anyway, that's another story for another time. But I would love to say to you that under persecution, I would still stand for Jesus. Even this morning, folk have disagreed, and you know what? That's fine. God bless you. But it's interesting in that moment that you've got to go, okay, do I change my beliefs? Do I come off slightly easier with this person so they don't get upset and leave the church and immediately begin to compromise what is important to me? We don't understand the persecution these guys were under. And so the fact that they stood is a big up. But then compromise starts to settle in because we don't want to offend, we want to grow the church, and we're scared out of our little skulls. It's interesting, most of the people in my life have little skulls. I'm joking. I'm joking, I don't even know where that comes from. Verse 14, <laughs> I hear you, uh, verse 14, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trick the people of Israel. So if you go back to Numbers 24 and Numbers 25, we have a fantastic situation where King, Balaam, uh, King Balak goes to the prophet Balaam to get him to prophesy against the children of Israel so that they, they would be, they'll be destroyed. And he's prepared to give him money for that. Now that's important because we all think that Balaam was a real goody two-shoes. No, he sold prophecy. That's what he did. He made money out of it. But when he came up against the Spirit of God, he couldn't change what the Spirit of God was saying. So Balak says to him, I can't, and he ends up blessing him. And I think, if I remember correctly, King Balak asked him three times. And he still, he says, I can't, I, I can't, I can't curse these people. Numbers 31, chapter, uh, Numbers 31, verse 16, there's a reference to a discussion that Balaam and King Balak had, where Balaam says to King Balak, if you want to destroy the children of Israel, you need to get your ladies to go and seduce their men, get them to break their marriage contracts, the, uh, mar mar marriage covenants, get them to fall in love with these women and not want to offend them and therefore bring in their beliefs. Start to build, start to have idols of theirs in your houses, start to have idols of theirs in your temples so that it will weaken the people of Israel and you will then be able to take them. Now, we can't find that in scripture. I went to the walking uh, encyclopedia, Biblical Britannica, that we affectionately called Dr. Henry, and we both went online, we both searched a whole bunch of places. There is no actual text in the Bible that says this. However, scholars are saying that there is a text that somehow got missed that had the story in it. So, we have people in Pergamum who are propagating breaking of marriage vows, bringing in of idols, eating unclean food, and the church that has stood against Satanism 
in its boldest outright form, is starting to accommodate some of this into their beliefs and go, you know what, it's, it doesn't really mean that. It's okay. We, we can do that. And so compromise starts to get in to the church and, it, uh, and into the city of Pergamon, and specifically with regards to idols and specifically with regards to uh, sexual practices within marriage. And we go on to then hear about the Nicolaitans in verse, I think it's 15. Now, the Nicolaitans, Acts, Acts chapter six and verse five, we have the appointment, the ordination and the release of the first deacons in the church. And one of them is a gentleman called Nicholas, who is the father of the Nicolaitans. Now, Nicholas was a proselyte. A proselyte means that he was a Gentile who then became Jewish, and then he became Christian, and he got made a deacon in the church. Wonderful guy. Now, I don't know what road he was on. I don't know what experience he was walking. But Nicholas <laughs> decided at some point, and this is why I'm telling you, please check everything that I say. Please check your word so that you have a revelation, because otherwise the story of Nicholas becomes way too apparent. But Nicholas was challenged that he should have no enjoyment greater than his encounter with God. And so for whatever length of time, he decided to abstain from the benefits of marriage with his wife. And from what I understand, it was a fairly long time. It was like a year, totally unbiblical. <laughs> okay, <laughs> think about it. Okay, so you can imagine now a young man sitting in the church going, this guy has given up sexual relations with his wife so that he can be closer to Jesus. I mean, wow, that's, there's some respect going on. It appears that Mrs. Nicholas was quite keen on the benefits of marriage. And because Nicholas wasn't that interested, she received those benefits from somebody else and entered into sexual, sh sexual sin. Once again, Nicholas didn't change his stance. He didn't go back and say, oh, I was wrong. He continues and says, well, it's part of the persecution, man. I'm loving Jesus and I'm, I'm not allowing myself to be debased, whatever that means in terms of sexual relations. She's had an affair, hey, I'm following Jesus. I'm following God. And you can imagine young people going, wow, what a boy. What a boy. Now, I don't know where this is in the Bible. I don't know where this belief is in the Bible. It's something that Nicholas came up with. Nicholas, I don't know if I'm saying it right. What has happened, though, is that the next young man who is a disciple of Nicholas gets 80% of the truth and adds a bit of his own. The next gets 60% of the truth and adds a bit of his own. And suddenly this thing that Nicholas went through is becoming not only... Do I, not, not only do we not value covenant with our wives, but we actually just sleep with all the ladies in the church or all the ladies we can. In fact, that becomes a part of your worship. And so we see how what could be, I don't know, I'm not taking a stance on it, but what could be a very, very good God-ordained moment between Nicholas and God slowly gets twisted through compromise until, hey, you can be a Christian and you can sleep around. Now let's have a look at the young men in the church who are going, I dig the gospel. Because I can be saved, I can be a Christian, but I can sleep with anyone. And this is alive and well in the city of Pergamon. They could very well have said, the city of Seattle. The licentiousness in Seattle the sexual experimentation, the, the whole transgender thing that has happened all started with little, little lies and little compromises until now as pastors, we are sometimes asked, I wanna come and visit your church and I'm a LGBT, whatever it is, and God bless them. I'm not mocking these people. They're clearly going through something, but I'm being asked to, what is the word? I need to affirm their lifestyle. Now, I'm not prepared to do that. I don't believe Eden is prepared to do that. I will affirm that you are a son or a daughter of God, a son or a daughter, but I will not affirm a lifestyle that says I 
am this, but I'm also this, and I can do this, and I can also do that. Unfortunately, in Seattle, there, there are churches, and in Seattle, in Johannesburg, and all over the, the world that are now gay churches. Or we, we, you know, LGBT, come on in. The, the one in the last church I was at, we were looking for new premises, and we looked to share with one of the churches in Seattle, and we walked in, and the probably four times the size of the screen was just this huge big rainbow with all kinds of LGBT messages in it. And I looked at that and I said, okay, so we got to come on in and share with that. Can we take it down? They said, no, no, that's one of the stipulations. And we were like, thanks so much. We'll look somewhere else. Once again, no judgment against these people. God bless you on your walk. If, you, if you're struggling in this area this morning, God bless you in the walk. You are, you are welcome here and you are loved. But I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I love you enough to tell you what the Bible says. God created man and he created woman and he created them to be together. One man, one woman. Six love. End of story. There is something about the covenant relationship of marriage that I just can't shake. For those of you who do come to church fairly regularly, you'll know that my last two sermons have both ended up in the covenant of marriage and the importance of it. I'm spending a lot of time looking at this going, God, I need further revelation. Not that I'm in any way unhappy in my marriage. I love Maria. I love being married. One of the best decisions I've ever made in my life until she starts critting my sermons. But but I'm just interested in why is this thing so important to God? And I'm hoping that the last couple of minutes we can, we can reveal more of that. Now, I want to tell you, because some people are going to go, oh, yeah, Brad, he's on the marriage thing again. I don't know that Darren planned this. In fact, I think I can say with a fair amount of confidence he did not. Darren knew that he was going to Thailand and to Cambodia, and he called in faith, and a couple of other people were like, I'm going to be out of town, and we're starting the revelation thing. We need to fill this. Who, who can handle this stuff? Oh, we need to get Pastor Greg in. We need to get Pastor Masood. Let's, let's give that South African a whirl. And so we come in, and it gets divvied up, and I get Revelations 2, verses 12 to 17. Why am I making such a big thing of this? The word Pergamum means marriage. You think God might be saying something. To the church at Pergamum, get away from sexual immorality. Get back to your covenant relationships of, of, of husband and wife. Don't be bringing anything else into that marriage that is going to take away from that covenant. It's not my fault. It's the way the cookie crumbled when we designed the whole thing. I got the church called marriage that is compromising. And folks, it really is a difficult walk. It's a difficult thing for us to, to fully grasp. Why marriage, why covenant is so important to God. God committed himself via a blood covenant to man, which says to me that God is not compromising with any other species. I cannot see anywhere where he entered into a covenant with giraffes. I don't think he went on a dating spree to find humans that we can have a relationship with. God knew it was us. He designed us for him. And then he shed his blood so that we would be in covenant with him. And his request is, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't go fiddle with other things. And I'll show you why in a second. Stay with me. I love you is the message. Ah, but Brad, verse 12 and verse 17 speak about the sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. I don't believe Jesus got a sword sticking out of his mouth. It's pictorial language. In Ephesians chapter 6, as we look at the armor of God, talks, Paul, <laughs> Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit. And he says it's the Word of God. It is truth. It cuts between spirit and soul. Truth exposes lies. Truth is the light. John, 1, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 7 is the light 
that shines and exposes the darkness. The darkness can't stand against it. No matter how dark dark is, you put a light on, it's, it's exposed. It just happens. There's a fantastic story of Billy Graham who gets called to come and be part of a four-ball celebrity competition. So he's going to be playing with some football players, he's going to be playing with some singers or whatever, there's four of them. And they head on out to the golf course and they play golf. And at the end of the day, the interviewer gets over to Billy Graham, uh, gets over to the guys on the team and says, so what is it like to have Billy Graham uh, on your team? And the one, person, the one guy says, I hate it. I can't handle being with Christians. I've got to get in your face all the time. And just the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. I mean, we were just there to have fun. They interview the guy standing next to him and he goes, what are you talking about? I don't think the guy brought the gospel up once. I was going to say, I love playing with a man of God who is just a normal Joe. But Billy Graham had the spirit of truth. And no matter where he went, the spirit of truth revealed the darkness that was around him. It's not that Billy Graham was going, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. He just was Billy Graham. Now, I'm going to suggest that the exact same is true of Jesus. Where Jesus goes, there is light. If you go where Jesus goes, you're going to be in the light. But if you choose to go somewhere else, you're going to be in darkness. And when Jesus pitches up there, he's bringing the light, and you're going to get burnt up with all that other truth, untruth that is there. So I tried this in the first service. I think it worked, so we'll give it a whirl again now. Otherwise, I'll be told about it in a drive on the way home. But <laughs> love you, babes. Look, we're in separate cars today. Hallelujah. <laughs> it doesn't mean she won't send me a text. No, babes, love you. Love you, babes. Okay, so let babes, won't you come and have coffee with me? at this, my lovely, I call it the coffee uh, gold bowl experience. So if you'd mind just sitting there and let's assume for, I'm not Jesus, but let's just assume. I've invited Maria into this coffee moment with me. I can't sit down, I've got a mic pack. And let's just say um, I invited Pastor Greg and Mary as well. Now, love and free will go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. If I take free will away from love, it's called abuse. So if I force Maria to love me, I'm abusing her. Jesus and God, Jesus and God, Jesus, God, know that in order for us to have pure love, we've got to have free will. So I send an invitation to Pastor Greg and Mary to be with us here, but they choose They've got a thing going on and there's... <laughs> okay, he's making this up on the go. There's a, there's, they're going to movies down the road. Okay, it's their choice. It's freedom of choice, right? So while I'm here with Maria, as normal, she basks in the sun. <laughs> she basks in the light of truth and love. <laughs> I keep telling her, you are so blessed. You're, you're so blessed. Okay. But there comes a point where Jesus is on the move. I need to go, and I'm going to end up at the movie house. It's not that in the back of the mind, I've been sitting here talking to Maria going, when I get all the pastor Greg and Maria, uh, Mary, they are going to pay. I am going to judge these guys into the ground. I don't believe that's what Jesus is doing. What I think Jesus is doing is as he goes there, he is aware that just by being present, untruth is going to be revealed and you're going to get burnt up with the darkness that is there. I feel that what Jesus is saying in the book of Revelation is come and be with me, please. I love you so much. I want you to come and be here so that when I go there, you are not destroyed. Yeah. I do not believe that he's walking around seeking whom he may devour. That language is used of Satan, not of God. Yeah. The sword that comes out of the mouth and the language that is used here is truth. And the truth will reveal untruth. Jesus' very presence, man, even when we talk about judgment, I, I'm telling you now, there is not a human on the planet that is going to be able to stand up and give a credible argument to God as to why he's wrong. There's verses in Scripture that say the first 
period of time in heaven is going to be dead silent where every single argument is just going to disappear. People aren't even going to be able to give it because the presence of God just burns up untruth. Your argument just goes... And either we've accepted Jesus' love, either we've accepted Jesus' forgiveness and there's no need for an argument, or we're going to have a really scary couple of minutes when we realize, "Uh uh-oh, this ain't going to (laughs) work. And no one said anything. You're just going to know. Jesus' presence burns up sin. So don't sin. Not because Jesus is a grumpy old man, or because God is a grumpy old man with violent tendencies, it's just showing up is gonna cause issues. So don't compromise, be with him. A couple of areas where the, the people were famous in, in Pergamum, medicine was a huge big industry in Pergamum. It was on a trade route and so there were lots of things coming on in and lots of different ideas. Folks, I love doctors, I respect doctors. Doctors have brought me back from very, very difficult situations. But I worship Jesus. I do tend to want to go the natural route and look at the food that I eat, which is brilliant. I I don't do any carbs or any sugars. Well, I haven't today yet, anyway. But I would far rather go and see what, what what is natural that is gonna fight against some of the viruses that are coming against us. And I might find turmeric or something that has um, something in it that is really helpful, but I worship Jesus. I don't worship turmeric. I thank Jesus for turmeric or garlic or chilies or whatever it is that you end up taking. I still worship Jesus. And specifically here in Seattle, we need to be very, very careful of some of the ideas that are going going around specifically in the health arena. And we need to be careful what we stand up and espouse from the stage in church check things out, go in with both hands. Go and read, go and research, go and speak to people. Find out what is true and then make your decision, but don't just accept it and try and wangle it into your Christianity. Other religious beliefs had gotten into the church, not just let's sleep around and and let's break our, our marriage contracts. I heard, you know, it upset me a little bit, but Somebody spoke about, uh, I don't know if it was, Maria, was it an 18th or a 21st birthday um, here in America? And this would, be, this would be typical in South Africa, so I'm not having a swing at the United States, but the young person, it's either the 18th or the 21st, it's a big birthday party, and they get drunk out of their skull. It ends up becoming a little bit undignified. People are throwing up, you know, it's not looking good. And this person is a worship leader. Not in this church, by the way. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just asked one or two questions and I was told, well, that's, that's what happens at your 21st. That's what happens at your 18th. And I'm going, um, no, not mine, not my wife's, not my son. In fact, I'm battling to think of people that lost it at those things. And I'm just going, that becomes an area of compromise. We kind of go, oh, well, they're just kids. They're this, that. No, no, no. That should never be an expectation. At your wedding, let's spike drinks and get people trashed. I mean, what is going on here? So let's be careful of those kind of beliefs. The other kind of thing that I want to just tackle a little bit, I mentioned to someone, a friend of mine in South Africa, so just know that it's not here, okay? (laughs) Somebody was very concerned after the first service. I said to someone, we've got Easter coming up. And I get a message back going, you are aware that you're worshiping Satan. Those dates of Easter are not the actual dates that Jesus died and rose again, and it's named after Ishtar or Ashtar or Asher or whatever. You are totally involving yourself and your church in pagan practice. And I'm going, brother, let's make this quite clear. I worship Jesus. I worship Jesus on the 28th of March, the 29th of March, the 30th of March, the 1st of April, I worship Jesus. In fact, I get up in the mornings and I say, Jesus, thank you for today. Yeah, 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 but Easter, Easter, Easter. I said, okay, well, which dates would you like me to choose? Because let me tell you, as much as I wake up every morning and give thanks to Jesus for my day, there's some little Satanists sitting there going, thank you, Satan, for my day. They have claimed the days just like we have. I worship Jesus. I worship Jesus on the 25th of December. I understand people have issues with it, but I worship Jesus. Thank you very much. 
There's no Satan worship going on. The point that I'm trying to make is let's be careful of bringing this into the church because it causes division. It causes division. You've got people who've never thought about this before suddenly going, well, who is Ishtar? Who is Asherah? Let's go and research this. Oh, Jesus wasn't. And all of a sudden we've got people going, I'm not 100% sure that Jesus was the Son of God. I worship Jesus. I'll tell you for nothing, Darren worships Jesus. This church worships Jesus any day of the week. Let's stick to it. Be careful what we adopt into our thinking because it's going to cause issues. Let's have the Bible be the center of our decision making and of our wisdom seeking. All of the speakers at the conference were outstanding, but I've got to tell you, I, I'm blown away by Bobby Connor. This guy can, rec can, can recite chapters of scripture. It is unbelievable, but the Bible has become central to everything that he does. I'm told as I read through the, the biographies that Smith Wigglesworth could not or would not read anything other than the Bible. Some people suggest that he had a, his capacity to comprehend and read disappeared unless it was the Bible. I don't know whether that's true or not. But there's something to these great men who just live and the Bible just oozes out of them and that should be our plumb line. Mainstream belief should be coming straight out of, the, out of the Bible. We need to stay sexually pure. My marriage is important to me. I cannot afford to have 1% of 1% compromise in my marriage. It leads to other stuff. Apparently, Balaam told Balak, start to let the people sleep around. And the next thing, they're taking on this, they're taking on that, they're taking on the next thing. I, I have got to make sure that the movies I watch, the music I listen to, the books I read, are not digging into my perceptions of marriage and what I hold to be very sacred between Maria and I. You need to walk out your walk. But I'm not prepared, you know, you, you, you need to go and watch this movie, Brad, which one? Oh, it's an independent one. I'm like, eh, probably not. Because I know what independent means. It means it should have a massive age restriction, but it's art. Where does art end and porn start? I don't know about you, but I can tell you for me. I don't want to see anybody else's anything. I, I want to invest into this. I want to invest into Maria. I want to invest into Maria and I. And I feel that that's the very simple message that God is sharing to the church at Pergamum. Invest into me as I've invested into you. We need to sh make sure that our practices, our beliefs comply with scripture. Our paradigm about revelations, our paradigm about the church at Pergamum should not be a vengeful, all-powerful, violent, confusing God who's coming to kill and destroy us. It is the loving Father sending us a marriage proposal. Come and be with me. You have the choice to go there, but I'd love for you to stay here, because if I go there, I can't help but bring exposure. The letter for Pergamum was for that day, but it is totally relevant to us now. It is for Eden. It is for Seattle. It is for you and me. And the message of Revelation is the greatest, most loving, amazing being that has ever existed, that will ever exist, going down on one knee and saying, I love you. Will you marry me? I don't know where you are this morning. I bless you. I love you. I don't know what paradigm you are viewing revelations out of, but that's the one I'd like to share with you. Tonight, you'll be overjoyed to hear that I'm probably not going to preach. <laughs> I really want to wallow in the love of God. I want to get more revelation that Jesus loves me. And so I've said to Josh, <laughs> open the doors, 
let's go straight into worship and ministry and let's just enjoy the love of the Father. I might say one or two things and I might bring one or two recaps. But even as I ask right now for the ministry team to come forward, we want to, we want to give people that opportunity to receive ministry. Yeah, come on forward, it's fine. I want to give people the opportunity to receive ministry if you, if you need prayer, if you need a moment with God, and be free in that place. I would, however, like to encourage you to focus on Jesus not your problem. I don't want to diminish your problem. I don't want to downplay your problem, but I do want to elevate the power and the love and the restorative person and the transformational power that Jesus is. And so bless you. Thank you for coming this morning. Come forward if you need ministry. Come again tonight if you just want to spend time in Jesus' presence. Um, Yep, that's what we're going to do. Hallelujah. Bless you all. See you later. Have a good afternoon.